All right. I've, I've put up the, I believe it's the eighth problem set, and made it due not this week, but, but uh, Monday of next week, the last day before, before the holiday. Um, it covers climate control and moisture control, and basically everything, uh, heating, cooling, adding humidity, subtracting humidity, things that we'll cover in the next couple of days. So Monday you should have uh, plenty of material under your belt to, to, to answer those questions. I will hold my office hour, my Monday office hours, this, I'm talking about next week, in the morning if you have last minute questions. Uh, if you're, if, <laughs> assuming you're here on Monday. Okay? Well, where things are in the, in, in the stories I'm trying to tell you, um, trying to control the flow of heat with clothing insulation. And this, this sort of assumes that if you want to make it hard for heat to flow, what do you do? And we talked about use low materials that don't conduct heat well. Those typically are, you know, they're, they're not metals. Metal's a bad choice for if you want to control heat, heat flow at least by conductivity. So use insulators, but actually some of the best insulators are the gases. Uh, air is a much better insulator than most solid materials. Uh, you could do a little better than air by using other gases, and just so before I forget, uh, some things like, like um, double pane windows are often filled at the factory not with air, but with argon, or in, in extreme cases, you can fill them with, with krypton, the very massive noble gases uh, conduct heat particularly poorly. So anyway, air is a great insulation. We use it for almost, you know, for, for a huge fraction of our insulation purposes. Clothing, hair, uh, the animals are all using air as insulation by, by virtue of holding it in place with fur and stuff like that. <sighs> convection, trying to shut down convection, that's certainly an issue uh, with air, and that's why you have these fine fiber uh, structures to keep the air from going so down, hair, fiberglass, insulation, they're all just trying to keep, keep the air from convecting so it stays in place and acts as a good insulator. Um, convection, uh, also before I forget, that uh, in, in windows, so this is just trying to be, be, be useful to you in the future, windows are one of the biggest places for heat loss in a house. Uh, choosing no windows would be a, a great option if you didn't care to see anything in or out of the, the house. But if you're going to have windows, be careful with them. And so first, first issue, don't have single pane windows. The old fashioned one pane did it all, wasn't good enough. If you've got a big temperature difference across that glass, it conducts heat better than you would like. So you go to two, glass, two, two panes of glass and you try to keep the heat from flowing from one pane to the other as, as, as well as you possibly can. And the outside pane is going to be pretty close to the temperature of the outside. The inside pane is going to be pretty close to the temperature of the inside. So you've got a big temperature difference between these two panes of glass. How do you keep heat from going from one to the other? Well, don't have them in touch, so you get to shut down conductivity, at least by, by glass to glass. You've got air between them, which is a pretty good insulator, so that's good. But now you get convection inside the window. You can't fill it with cotton wool or fiberglass or anything like that. So the air is going to move. Uh, it turns out, fortunately, that in a double pane window where the two windows are quite close together and the the, they're, it's oriented vertically, what air naturally does is it, it picks up heat on the hot side, so this, let's assume that it's a winter day, and the inside of your house is, is warmer than the outside uh, air. The air between the two windows is going to pick up heat as it approaches the inside pane, because that's the warm pane. It's going to rise vertically along the entire surface of the pane. It will reach the top of the pane, of the, of the window, and then it will descend along the cold outside surface. It will create a convection cell that's, that's the whole height of the pane. I, I, talked, I talked way back about convection cells. Uh, when, I, when I showed you the, the, the thing of water with a, with a little heater in it, convection cells in general form when you have a hot, a, 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 some source of heat or ultimately a source of, a, a destination for heat. 
that the heat rises off of a certain area, goes up, moves sideways somewhere, let's just say just to your, to your uh, left, and then descends, having lost most of its heat, so it's colder, descends once it's cold, goes over, picks up heat, warms up, rises. It makes a cell structure, just, just a circulation. That's what, so the, cell, the word cell, convection cell, is just a reference to a, to a, to a, a closed loop of circulation. And the convection cells in a vertical double pane window are very tall. And they involve a lot of viscous drag of the air trying to work its way al along a stationary glass surface and then down a stationary glass circuit surface. Long and short of it is the convection cells in a, in a double pane window are pretty poor at carrying heat from the inside window, in this case, to the outside, or vice versa in the summer. So that's good. That is not, what, what, what's not so good is if you take that same window and you make a skylight out of it, you put it horizontally, now the convection cells, instead of being long and thin along the entire window, they're little local things and they work very nicely. Uh, he, in, in the case of a winter day, the air or the gas inside the, the double pane window picks up heat on the bottom surface, rises, gives it to the to the heat only inches away on the top surface where it's cold, and then goes down to pick up more. So long and short of it is, skylights are a big heat loss compared to windows. That shift from being or, uh, oriented vertically along the window, uh, the wall of your house where a window normally is, to being on the ceiling of the house, that, that is a big cost there. So skylights are a good, good way to lose heat in your house, for better or worse, it's a sad, sad but true. Um, hopefully you can see why. So you get lots of little, in, in the skylight, you get lots of little convection cells that work very nicely and carry heat from one pane to the other. It's a problem. If you're willing to give up uh, transparency for translucency, you can put fiber in there to stop the heat flow by, by convection. Any questions? Or, um, so. The last thing to talk about in terms of insulation, I mean, there, there are thousands of little topics, but things to, to, to pay attention to that are key points are the loss of heat by radiation. Radiated heat transfer, um, because it varies with temperature to the fourth power on it, where, where we're talking about absolute temperature, it does some sort of mysterious things. Um, just, just to remind you that the power that flows by, by virtue of, of radiation has to do with the the color, as in the, the emissivity of the surface, the, the constant nature, the temperature to the fourth power, and, and finally the surface area that's conveying the heat. Basic, we talked about that before, um, but to see, to see sort of where this shows up uh, and, and why it's important. If you stand in front of a freezer, you know, you're trying to pick, pick, your, pick your favorite flavor ice cream or whatever it's good today, you stand in front of it, and even though you're not touching the cold air that's in the freezer and you're not in its convective path, it basically is descending onto the floor and it might be cooling your, your toes, but not so much your face, you feel pretty cold standing there in front of the freezer. And what's going on, and I give you four choices for why it might, be, why it might feel so cold, so I'll, I'll let, you, let you all make your choice. How many think that you're radiating more, radiating more heat at the freezer than it is radiating at you? How about that it's radiating cold at you? How about that it's radiating less heat, or sorry, you're radiating, radiating less heat than normal? And how about you are radiating more heat than normal? Okay, you, you all got it. I mean, the, the, most people voted, and it's, it's A, it's just you're radiating more heat at it than, than it is at you. The, the difference is dramatic, even though the temperature difference isn't that huge. Your, your temperature is somewhere around body temperature, and the freezer's temperature is somewhere around zero Fahrenheit, or minus 10 or 20 Celsius. Um, you know, it's a, it's a significant temperature difference, but it's not like liquid nitrogen. The issue is that the, because thermal radiation goes as, as the fourth power of temperature on an absolute scale, it's radiating a tiny fraction of the thermal energy at you, the, uh, that you are radiating at it. You're way brighter in the infrared than it is in the infrared. 
And so you're sending heat to it. And, and a, a person's surface, I don't, I, I've tried to figure this out or look it up, is you know, we're something like maybe a square meter of surface. Um, if you look at this, 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 this uh, formula, that how much power we radiate, and you look up the Stefan Boltzmann uh, constant and our surface temperature and stuff, we radiate somewhere in the several hundred watts of thermal energy. So if you, what you're sending out from your skin, and with some, you know, clothed or unclothed, it makes a little, you know, make, gets a little complicated. But, but still, we're sending out several hundred watts of thermal radiation, and we're expecting to get back about the same amount from our environment. And that's what's going on right now. You guys are all radiating away several hundred watts of thermal radiation to your environment. But that's not a big deal because your environment sends back pretty close to that same amount. It's, it's not far away from your, your personal temperature, too. If you go into a place where, the where part of the environment refuses to send back thermal radiation at you, like when you're standing in front of the freezer, that several hundred watts you send out is not replaced. You get back half that, maybe, because your back is still exposed to the, the warmer room. That's a big loss. You're losing maybe 100, 200 watts of thermal, of thermal power. Uh, that's the opposite of, of standing in front of a, a couple hundred watt space heater. So um, it's noticeable, that loss of thermal radiation coming back at you. Is that okay? All right. That's the thing with space heaters. Space heaters, and I'll, and I'll probably rant and rave about these a little later on. Space heaters just turn electricity directly into thermal energy. They are 100% efficient because energy is conserved. Every bit of electric power that comes in goes out as thermal power. Uh, it turns out, as we'll see, you can do better. You can actually uh, use that lovely ordered electricity to do something better than just turn it into thermal energy. But anyway, it, uh, most of the thermal energy, well, it comes out in all forms. You don't want to touch it, so you don't want to get it by conduction. You want to get it mostly by convection off of, the sur off of its surface, but a lot of it's radiation. And so if you see the filaments there glowing red, like the filaments of a toaster, um, there's what you can't see is a huge amount of, of infrared thermal radiation that's, that's accompanying the small amount of visible radiation. We talked about the forest fire stuff. So this question is, is, is a reminder of, of way back when, that if you, if you go into a, a, a if you're caught in a forest fire, you want to be low to get away from convection. You want to not touch anything to get away from conduction, and you want to be shiny as can be to avoid uh, picking up thermal radiation. So these shiny metallic uh, emergency tents are life-saving, literally. Okay, um, what I want to sort of finish up with in terms of thermal radiation is just to give you a, a little more background on the spectrum of thermal radiation. I've talked about it a lot already, but, but just uh, maybe these pictures should have shown up way, way earlier. The thermal radiation from a very hot object like the sun, so this is the sun here, this is a, this is a depiction or a, a, a graph of the, of the spectrum of wavelengths of, of electromagnetic waves associated with light from a surface that's, what did I say here, 5,800 Kelvin which is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Super hot, right? That's the surface of the sun from which the, the sun's thermal radiation originates. The outer, it's called a photosphere. It's a certain layer within the sun. Before it gets so dilute and, and, and fluffy that, that, it, that it stops being, it becomes thermally, it becomes transparent, basically. So the last layer of the sun before it becomes transparent emits light that, that is primarily in the visible. Here's the rainbow spectrum, and here's most of the light. The peak of its, of its radiative power is, is somewhere in the green or something. But it also includes some infrared over here on the, at the long wavelength side. It's a weird graph. I've got wavelength going, getting bigger to the left. So this is wavelength getting bigger. Uh, the other equivalent parameter is, is called frequency, and frequency in this case would go, would get bigger to the right, because frequency times wavelength is a constant. In any case, a lot of thermal radiation from the sun, because it's so hot, in the visible. Some, some significant amount in the infrared, and also some in the ultraviolet. And so one of the reasons why the, 
Well, the, the ultraviolet you, you all know of because it causes suntan and sunburn and other things. Uh, it's, it's a mixed bag getting that ultraviolet radiation. Um, fortunately, we have some protection, but from our own atmosphere absorbs parts of that ultraviolet. This is the, the ozone hole story, which was before your time, but was an issue. One of the reasons why we've been society, civilization has been a little careful about what chemicals it puts into the Earth's atmosphere was because it was wiping out this protective uh, ozone uh, component to the atmosphere that was absorbing parts of the ultraviolet radiation we don't really want to be exposed to. Anyway, so that's, that's life for a very hot object. It emits a lot of visible light. If the object's not so hot, for example, 2700 Kelvin is about the temperature of the filament of an, in, of an incandescent light bulb which is becoming rarer and rarer, but you still remember incandescent light bulbs. And they couldn't get up to the temperature of the sun because they melt. It's, and it's a filament of tungsten. That's, this is about as hot as you can get it without giving it a life that's, that's unbearably short. And it emits thermal radiation, and that's what you see from an incandescent light bulb, but most of it is in the red, which is why incandescent lighting whether it's truly from, a, from an incandescent light bulb or whether it's imitated by modern lights. Um, this room actually has a mixed collection. These lights near the front are a different color than the lights in the back. Um, the lights in the back look like they're trying to imitate incandescent light, and the lights in the front are trying to imitate uh, more sunlight. There's a redder hue to the, to the lights near the back. Can you see the difference in color in the lights? Uh, this, this is a pinker color than this one. Do you, you agree with that? Yeah. Um, if you, fluorescent lamps, I, I still teach about it in, 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 the, um, in, the, in the spring course, but even fluorescent lamps are going away. It's like I used to teach how incandescent light bulbs work and they're going away, and then fluorescent light bulbs and they're going away, and now LEDs are taking over everything. But, but the different fluorescent lights and the different in, uh, LED lights, they still like to imitate the colors of the sunlight, which is this spectrum you see here, and the colors of incandescent or candlelight. Candlelight's an extreme incandescent. It's even cold. It's even lower temperature. But incandescent light produces a redder light. They claim it's white. It's a you know, white light from incandescent light bulb. What's white is a matter of opinion. As you can see, the, the, the light emitted by an incandescent light bulb filament, it's got all the wavelengths in it associated with visible light, but it's very heavy in the red. So when you illuminate something with incandescent light or an imitation of incandescent light, you're illuminating it with, with more red, than, it, than relatively more red and less blue than is present in true sunlight. So although you might say, this is white, it's not the same white as sunlight white. They're distinguishable. And that's why these, these the lamps in overhead are um, you can see it. I, I, I'm wondering about this light here. It looks like they put in a daylight-ish tube and an incandescent-ish light tube in the same, in the same uh, lighting outlet. The people who are plugging them in aren't paying attention to where they're, you know, which, which tube they're choosing. They're choosing multiple imi different imitations of different lights. Any questions about the difference between incandescent light and from an incandescent? Light from an incandescent light bulb and light from the sun in terms of the wavelength, it's, it's just worth knowing a little bit about. This is why if you may have a makeup mirror that has both cho two choices of illumination, incandescent or, or um, daylight, because the spectrum of light's different. And how you will look reflected in the mirror will depend on what you're illuminated by. If you're illuminated by pure green light, you're gonna look green promise you, because there's no red around. Okay, so we could all be little green people. Just turn on, you know, put green filters in front of all the lights. It would be real. Okay, anyway, this is all still high temperature thermal radiation. Although, but by the time you get to the incandescent light bulb, you can see most of the thermal radiation coming out of the light bulb is in the infrared here. Most of it's energy goes out as infrared light, which, no, which does nothing, no good for us in terms of seeing anything. And this is why incandescent light bulbs are fading away, is they're so energy inefficient. They produce a lot of light that we can't see and doesn't do any good except make us, it makes us warm and nothing else. 
Um, if you ever had a, an Easy Bake Oven, do Easy Bake Ovens still exist? Do they still use a light bulb as the, as the heating source? Yeah, it's because they produce a little light. I think this light bulb produces a little light and a lot of heat. And you can cook cakes, very little ones, but you can cook them with a light bulb. All right, how about for us? We're not nearly this hot. We're certainly not as hot as the sun. We're not even as hot as an incandescent light bulb. We're down here at about 300-ish Kelvin. And the thermal radiation we emit is on a different scale. This is, this is not the same uh, wavelength scale anymore. It's shifted way out into the infrared. Uh, none of it is visible. It's all in the infrared here. It peaks somewhere uh, 8, 9, 9,000 micron, uh, 9,000 nanometers. It's way in the infrared for us. I can't see it. You can feel it as thermal, thermal radiation. And that, that's, all right, I've said enough about that. Any questions about uh, the spectrum, spectrum of thermal radiation? Um, okay. Uh, before I do this, just having told you about the spectrum of thermal radiation, the last thing I want to talk about, and, I, and I've alluded to this, uh, I've talked about this a little bit before. Again, for practical purposes, windows. I told you about, about double pane windows or maybe triple pane windows, which are just more of a good thing. The double pane windows, if you, mount, if you mount them vertically, and so at some point in your life, you'll be, put, you'll be doing, dealing with windows, and may, hopefully you'll remember a little bit about this if, if it's useful. And, so, so that the salesperson doesn't sell you something you don't need or do need wrong. Here it is. To keep the f heat from flowing from one window to the other, mount them vertically so as to, to get this, these long convection cells that don't work very well. Fill them with a gas that doesn't conduct heat well. Air is, is decent. You can do a little better with things like argon. You certainly don't want any moisture in them because the moisture will condense on the cold surfaces from time to time. And you have all surely seen double pane windows that have condensation issues in them. They got moisture in them, and the moisture condenses. Uh, when, whenever it gets cold enough, that moisture just starts sticking on, the, on, one of, on the, cold, the cold pane and clouding it up. I've got several bad windows in my, in my office. There are these little mullioned uh, double panes, like this size, and about 20% of them are bad. Okay, last thing to worry about, though, is the radiation. Those two window panes are staring at each other across gas. And they are, without anybody working on them, they are very good at emitting thermal radiation at each other. And if you've got one hot pane and one cold pane, the hot pane is going to radiate a lot more thermal radiation at the cold pane than the cold pane is going to radiate at the hot pane. And heat is going to flow from hot to cold. What are you going to do? What, what modern windows do the, uh, is they coat one of those panes. And there probably is a reason to coat one versus the other, and I don't remember which it is. They coat one of the panes on its inside surface, where you can't touch it, where it's safe, with a reflective material, basically a, an electrical conductor that is transparent to visible light. And I told you these exist. These are part of every computer monitor and electric gadget where you've got a display. You're looking through a conductor that's transparent. Um, normally, conductors are not transparent. They are shiny, metallic looking. But these conductors are special because the frequency of, of visible light is so fast pushing the charges back and forth in the conductor that the conductor throws up its hands and says, I can't deal with these. So these transparent conductors are, are not capable of conducting electricity at frequencies associated with visible light. They can handle it at frequencies into the infrared, though. The details of that, what I just said, are detail. So if you put these transparent conductors on, the, on one surface of a double pane window, you get this great arrangement. Where the, where the hot, let's say we put it on the cold pane. The hot pane sees a reflection of itself in this metallic, metal-like surface. So the hot pane sees its own thermal radiation coming back at it and says, wow, this is great, it's nice and warm. And doesn't give away, you know, it receives back as much heat as it sends. The cold pane doesn't send out any thermal radiation at all. It just reflects the hot pane, you know, talk to the hand. 
um, to the hot pain thermal radiation. And as a result, you get very little thermal radiation, uh, very little heat flows by thermal radiation from one pane to the other. Um, the great system, it works well as long as nothing gets into the window. Like the, the seal remains good. Those windows are, are sealed, they're, they're coated at the factory. Uh, that's a, and it's a fascinating process. They actually they, they do it under a vacuum. They, they expose the glass to, a, to a, 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 a coating process in vacuum. They then slap the two panes together and they seal it forever, put the gas in, seal it off. They hope it's sealed for all eternity. In, in reality, it, it, it frequently leaks anyway. And when it leaks, then some of the, the atmospheric chemicals get in there and react with that, that conductive layer and turn it weird colors and stuff. So you've also probably seen color windows that have gone bad that not only get cloudy be, uh, uh, where moisture has gotten in, but they get kind of color-y, um, interference colors, weird soap, soap film colors, runk, dining center, uh, this is before your time, um, years ago, I was principal at, at, at Hereford Residential College, and, and so Runk was right there all the time. And those windows, this, this, this huge glass front window, it was, it was just like multicolored. It looked like, you know, some butterfly of colors. And they'd all gone bad. They were all reflecting weird, crazy colors. Oh, well, they've replaced it since, and I think it's color-free. But you, you know, if you notice a window, a, a multi-pane window that looks really strange, and blotchy and all that. It's this, it's this, uh, it's called a low emissivity uh, coating has gone bad, gotten contaminated and, and rotted. All right, they're called low E or low emissivity windows because one of the panes has a low emissivity. It's metallized in effect. And metals have low emissivity, right? They're like shiny. Any questions about windows, insulation in houses, insulation in people? All right, so the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere, this is you know, as, as, as relevant a topic as, as, as there is for, for you all. Um, so why do the greenhouse gases warm the Earth? And there are many ways to analyze this. And, and so, so I'm following a path that, I, that actually was, was given to me by, t told to me by Dave Pritchard, who's an who's a, a amazing physicist at, at MIT, um, known him forever. In any case, this is a, it's very, to me, a very simple reason to, why, why greenhouse gas, to, simple way to understand why greenhouse gases have to warm the Earth. So here's the story. The, the Earth is sitting here in the vicinity of two, two things, I guess. One is the sun, which is radiating heat toward it, toward the Earth. I mean, the, the, the Earth and the, and the sun are radiating heat at each other. The sun, because it's so much hotter, is radiating way more heat at the Earth than the Earth radiates at the sun. It's basically a, a one-way street. So the, the, the thermal radiation from the sun comes in, and if the Earth didn't get rid of that heat at the same rate it came in, the Earth would get hotter and hotter and hotter. We were neglecting melting transitions and stuff like that. You add heat to something, it gets hotter. So it, it turns out the Earth at this point in time is getting rid of heat as fast as it's coming in. How do we get rid of it? The Earth's atmosphere, beyond the atmosphere, there's nothing out there. To, so it can't be by conduction, it can't be by convection. It's by radiation. The Earth is receiving heat by radiation from the sun, and it's getting rid of heat by radiation into the deep, empty void of space. And the temperature of the deep, empty void of space, it's not absolute zero, but it's close. It's like three Kelvin, it's really cold. The fact that it's not zero and that it's three Kelvin is itself interesting, but a whole other story. It's, it's one of the features of, of, of the ways in which we know about the Big Bang. So um, this, the Earth is radiating away. Well, that means that the Earth is receiving thermal radiation in the visible primarily, because it's coming from the sun at high temperature, and it's radiating away thermal radiation mostly in the infrared, because it's coming from a, 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 the Earth is more like you know, room temperature-ish. But they are actually in balance. And how can it be balanced given that, that, that heat's coming in from this super hot source and going out into the super cold source? Well, there's a lot more 
empty space and there is sun, at least in our, in, in our the, the sun subtends only a small, uh, what's called a solid angle, an angle in both directions. Uh, it, it, it's little, fortunately, otherwise we would get pretty toasty warm here. So it's little, but if you look at the flow of heat in and the flow of heat out, they are in balance. For that to balance though, the temperature of the Earth has had to rise up from super low. It has had to increase to get to a nut, the high enough temperature that, that given its, uh, its emissivity and the, the Boltzmann constant and uh, the, the Stefan Boltzmann constant and its surface area, and stuff, it has to have risen up to the right temperature to send out heat as fast in the infrared as it receives in the visible from the sun. Struck a balance. If it were too cold, it wouldn't radiate, if the earth were too cold, it wouldn't radiate away heat fast enough, it would warm up. If it were too, if it were too warm, it would radiate heat faster than it receives it from the sun, it would cool down. It's negotiated a settlement. And the settlement is that the temperature at which it radiates corresponds to a surface at minus 18 degrees Celsius. It's a, it's a back of the envelope calculation or a napkin calculation. Very, it's a very simple one. The Earth, given its size, the sun's size, the, the balance is struck when the, when the Earth's radiating away heat as an object at minus 18 Celsius. Is that okay, or questions about that idea? What, that, why the Earth picked that temperature? It's got a right, just the right temperature to radiate away 100% of the heat that comes from the sun. All right, the question is where is that surface? That minus 18 degree surface, um, is, is the surface that effectively radiates away the right amount of heat to, to balance the sun. If there were no atmosphere, that surface would be the surface, literally the surface of the Earth, and we would be walking around a surface that's at minus 18 Celsius. Pretty cold. Okay, but the Earth isn't, it's not like the moon, it has an atmosphere. The Earth ha has this atmosphere around it, and as a result, the atmosphere gets involved. And the atmosphere is pretty transparent in the visible but it's not so transparent in the infrared. And as a result, it's got some parts of the infrared that's pretty good at, thermal, at emitting thermal radiation from with. So the surface from which the, the thermal radiation is coming off the Earth and, and, and balancing the sun isn't literally the ground. It's the ground and some of the atmosphere uh, is involved. And if you average it all out, you discover that the the, the thermal radiation from the sun, average across all the different wavelengths, and it's coming not, on average, not from the ground level. It's coming from about five kilometers above ground level. It's an approximation, but, but, but you can imagine that the, that the soup that is the surface of the Earth and the, and the stuff around it called the atmosphere, they're emitting thermal radiation, and where, if you look, where, where's the average location from which that thermal radiation is coming from? The astronauts looking down. Mm, it's not the ground, it's on average a little higher. It's about five kilometers up. So far so good? All right. Um, the, the ability of the atmosphere to participate in emitting the thermal radiation from the Earth depends on what's in the atmosphere. If the atmosphere were absolutely pure helium or maybe even pure oxygen, nitrogen, but certainly very simple gases, it would be so transparent that, that most of the thermal radiation would come from the ground level. But it's a mishmash of various chemicals, including water, uh, and certainly carbon dioxide, famous one, methane, other things. So it's coming from about five kilometers up. And that by itself seems fine. So okay, so not all thermal radiation comes from the ground, big deal. Well, it, it, it is an issue because the atmosphere does more than just participate in the, in the thermal radiation process. It also has a temperature gradient in it. Uh, it is, you, you've noticed if you go to high altitude, you go, out, you go into the mountains for a day and it's cooler up there. You go to the Blue Ridge, it's gonna be cooler up in the Blue Ridge than it is down here. And the reason for that, as we'll see uh, when I start talking about how air conditioners work shortly, is that if you take, I mean, a way to think about it, the air up there is lower in density than the air down here. So if you took a balloon, because the pressure is lower up there, right? There's less overhead weight. So you take a balloon of air, and you just drive merrily up into the mountains with that balloon of air. Uh, as the pressure decreases, the balloon is going to swell. 
It's going to get bigger, right? Um, if you let go of a helium balloon, it gets bigger as it goes up. I told you eventually it pops. Right? Sad but true. And that was crushing to me when I first figured it out. Um, but if you take a balloon, just an ordinary air-filled balloon up into the mountains, it's going to get bigger because if it keeps the same density as it had at ground level, its pressure is going to be same pressure as ground level, but the air up there isn't. It's going to, so you're going to have a terrible pressure imbalance between the high pressure trapped in the balloon and the now lower surrounding atmospheric pressure. The balloon's going to swell outward. And as a balloon swells while you're just driving or pedaling up into the mountains, it's, it's, it's moving outward. It's pushing on the air around it because the air pushes on it. It pushes on the air. Newton's third law. It's pushing on the air around it. And as it swells, that air around it is moving outward in the direction it's pushing. So the balloon is doing work on the air around it as it goes up in the mountains. You follow that idea? That swelling balloon does work on the air around it. That means energy came out of the balloon. The balloon conveyed energy to the surrounding air as it went up into the to high altitude. Whoa, where'd that energy come from? It came from the thermal kinetic energy that used to be in the balloon. That's the only source of energy the balloon's got, is, the, is the, just the thermal motion of its atoms and molecules. They cooled down. So the long and short of it is, as you go up in altitude with a balloon, the balloon is going to actually drop in temperature. And whether you actually have it trapped in a balloon or, or it's not trapped in a balloon and you go up, the air's still going to get cooler. The, the, the skin of the balloon is just sort of a, helps you visualize it, but it doesn't really matter. If you take air from down here up, up to, to, to 10,000 feet, it's going to get colder as it expands. So if you have a natural temperature gradient in the atmosphere, you know, un unavoidable, the higher you go, the colder it gets. It's a, it's a little more complicated because there, there are other processes going on. But, but if you go up a, a kilometer, the temperature of, this, of the air drops by about 6.6 6 Celsius on average, and sort of unavoidable. It's, it, there's, there's moisture effects in here too, but, it's, but it's, uh, th that's about the value you come out with. So at if you go up five kilometers, then the temperature drops a lot. It drops about 33 Celsius, 33 degrees Celsius. So that means that if you go five kilometers to the effective location, the effective altitude, I should say, of the Earth's radiating surface, the place from which its thermal radiation heads off into space on average, the temperature up there is minus 18 Celsius. And that's 33 degrees colder than the temperature down at, at five kilometers deep where, the, where we live. So we live in an environment of about 15 plus, plus 15 Celsius. So on average, you know, averaging over the year and all that, in locations all over the Earth, whatever, we live down here in an environment of, of about 15 Celsius. The reason for it being about 15 Celsius is because the Earth is radiating away th the sun's thermal radiation from an altitude of about five kilometers, and that surface is minus eight, eight, 18 to be in balance with the sun. And we're 33 degrees warmer than it because we're down five kilometers deep. So hopefully this makes sense. We, that, that's what sets our 15 degree Celsius average surface temperature for the Earth. The need to radiate away the sun's heat the fact that the radi radiation surface is about five kilometers up on average, and that the temperature of that surface in order to, to radiate the way the sun's heat is minus 18 Celsius. That, that, those are all the things that matter. Questions about that? That said, if we put gunk in the atmosphere that makes it darker in the infrared, again, we can't see the infrared, so the air looks, hey, it looks great, right? It looks clear, transparent here. It's not so transparent in the infrared. And I'd love to have one of these thermal image, imaging cameras because then you can see that it's not clear. You can see, for example, if someone breathes out, you can see the carbon dioxide, which is dark, coming out of their mouth, or a smokestack, or methane leaking from here and there. Um, those gases, the, the air is not so transparent in the infrared. Uh, in some places on, on, on Earth, it's not so transparent and visible either. I mean, we were putting a lot of stuff out there. And if you could see that, that in the infrared, we might be, might be you know, having trouble seeing each other through this, 
this mishmash of chemicals. As we put more junk out there, we make the, earth dark, the, the atmosphere darker, and it becomes better at radiating thermal radiation. So instead of radiating it from five kilometers up, it radiates it from five and a half kilometers up, or six. This is what we're doing. We're, we're effectively lifting the, the, the surface from which the Earth radiates away its share of solar radiation. We're lifting it to higher altitudes with more and more junk in the air. Uh, water contributes to this, and this comes up in, you know, very, in, in, in the great debates over the science is still out, that kind of stuff. Oh, water's a greenhouse gas. Yeah, that's true. But, but if you look at all the pieces put together, it, it, we're, we're clearly increasing the, Earth's, uh, the atmosphere's darkness. Um, and we're pushing that, that radiating surface to higher altitude. And as we do that, if it's, if instead of being at, at five kilometers, suppose it's at six kilometers, you know, huge, huge increase in altitude, that's an additional 6.6 .6 degrees Celsius difference between the radiating surface and where we live. So instead of living at, at uh, 33 degrees above that minus 18 surface, we'd be living at 39.6 degrees above it, which is 21, 22, you know, above room temperature on average, above the ordinary room temperature on average. It would be pretty hot down here. On, you know, summers would be, would be literally deadly. So it's a, it's a problem. Uh, it's a problem for you all. You're, you're going to live through the, the battles over this, and they're already starting. Uh, but there are certain you know, people my, my age and, and, and up are, are kind of saying, they, you know, who cares? Who can, you know, no, you know, it's not real. Science is still out. You know, come on. The science is, the science is in. It's happening. It's a big issue. Uh, it, age matters because the older you are, the less into this you're going to live. But otherwise, you all are going to live through a lot of this. And uh, don't let the real estate agents sell you beachfront property at, at sea level plus seven inches uh, in the, any time in the near future, um, unless you just like to, 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 to own an uh, 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 ocean bottom. <laughs> what? Okay, so um, the greenhouse gases. Water is one, but it's, you know, this is, in effect, beyond our control. It's, it's part of the system, but it's, uh, it's, it's in its all. I, you know, why, why are these guys? The very simplest of the atoms and molecules have no way to handle uh, absorbed uh, light. They don't interact with light very much at visible light and below. They have very limited ways. Pure atoms, simple atoms, really can only emit Minerals are very specific colors, like neon. You, you, know, you know the neon red. It's associated with the, with the quantum mechanical structure of the neon atom. But neon's going to be pretty seriously transparent in the infrared. Um, diatomic molecules where the two atoms are identical, oxygen, oxygen, and nitrogen, nitrogen. They are very, there are strict limits on what, what infrared uh, wavelengths they can absorb. Very, very limited. In fact, they're mostly transparent in the infrared. The molecules that are complicated, water being one, you know, it's, it's, it's minimally complicated, but it's, it's, it's on oxygen and two hydrogens, and they're not in line. Uh, carbon dioxide, it's an oxygen and two carbons. And so those get complicated enough, they can absorb and, 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 and play with and emit, therefore, thermal radiation. Um, the more complicated the molecule, the more ways it can inter interact with radiation. So methane's even worse than carbon dioxide, and some of the refrigerants that, that have been popular, uh, the, the gases used in refrigeration. Um, they're complicated, and they absorb infrared and therefore emit it very nicely. So keeping those under control is a project for your lifetime. Um, who knows where it's going to go? I mean, that, the, the, the results are still out. The science is not. Science has been in for a while. Um, any questions about greenhouse gas stuff? I, I, you know, and in fact, I say I wish you well, but you know, it's uh, it's tough. It is a big problem. Let me get let me sort of give you a, a start on 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 air conditioners where where we're headed, um, and it's a central issue for for the problem set that's coming up. We've seen the heat flows from hot to cold. It's driven statistically, so it ha happens. Um, 
not because of the laws of motion, but which, which are different to which way heat flows. It's a matter of statistics. It's like you're not going to win the lottery a thousand times in a row. The, 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 the laws of motion permit it. You can roll the dice or, or pick the numbers. In principle, you can, you can win it a thousand times in a row. Statistically, however, it never happens. So that said, heat flowing from hot to cold, how in the world do you, do you start with a room and an environment, a house, a house and an environment, and they're all at one temperature? How can you make the house colder than its environment? As you make it colder, heat's going to want to flow from hot to cold and kill off the colder. Well, how did you make it colder in the first place, and how do you keep it from, uh, from, from undoing that? How, uh, uh, he, given any chance, heat is going, to want to, is going to want to fill in that cold spot. Well, good insulation can prevent the heat from filling in the cold spot, but creating the cold spot is itself a big challenge. And we know one way, actually, how to do this already. And if you have, if it's a dry, dry day, and you've got a container of water, you can let the water evaporate, because water loves to evaporate. And the water will get colder as it evaporates, because it's using, it's using its thermal energy to throw off water molecules into the dry air. So if you start with water at room, at pick, let's define room temperature as a very specific temperature. You start with water at room temperature and the, the room air at that temperature, the water can actually get colder than room temperature. This is actually permitted by the laws of physics. So how is that happening? The, the water gets colder. This is, seems like it violates this whole idea of heat flowing from hot to cold. Right? Well, what's happening is the system started with a considerable amount of order in it. You had liquid water in a confined space, which is an orderly arrangement of the water. And you had the room air nice and dry with, no air, with essentially no water in it. That is an orderly arrangement. It's like you start, like your sock drawer, where you've got all the red socks on one side and all the green socks on the other. In this case, all the red socks are maybe the water, and all the green socks are the dry air molecules. Statistics, the same statistics that were gumming up the idea of, of the same statistics that want to cause heat to flow from hot to cold are involved in the flow of heat, flow of liquid water into dry air. That flow of liquid water into dry air, which loves to happen, evaporation is, is, is statistically um, favorable. What's, what's really happening there is order gets used up. You started with this orderly arrangement of liquid water and, and dry air. I hope you can realize that you, you, you accept the idea that it's, that's an orderly arrangement. It, it didn't happen by chance. You had all the water molecules trapped in the bottle. That's not a chance arrangement. The, the movement of the water molecules out into the air, you're losing track of them. You're damaging the order. You're, you're, you're crushing the order. It's like mixing your sock drawer up, shaking your sock drawer. The red and the green socks, they're all over the place. S statistics likes that, th that loss of order. It's statistically likely. And in this case, the water spreading out into the room air is so statistically favorable that, the, that it's, it, it allows part of the system to get colder than the rest of the room. Namely, the, the, the remaining water cools down. Th that's OK in this situation. What you're doing is you are the overall disorder. And we'll see there's a, there is actually a measure in, in, in physics and in nature. There is a way of measuring what's called disorder. It's, an, it's, a, it's a, a measure that you've heard people talk about before, and we'll, we'll define it. It's called entropy. Uh, it's an unfortunate choice of name to me because it sounds a heck of a lot like energy. They're totally different. Entropy is the measure of how, of how messed up and disordered something is. It turns out when water evaporates into dry air, the disorder goes up. The entropy goes up, and it goes up by enough to allow the the, the gods of statistics to create a cold spot in the room, namely that, that portion of water that, that remains. It's colder than the rest of the room. That's OK, because this was a statistically favorable uh, process overall. So that's just a little amuse-bouche for, for uh, the, the story of air conditioners. 
and the story of how you really work with heat, what's called thermodynamics.